Uh, joining us right now is Bishop Athanasius Snyder. Uh, good morning to you, Your Excellency. Good morning. Uh, Your Excellency, it's uh, wonderful to have you on this morning. Um, you, he, to our conversation today, we're talking about his uh, book, Credo, his catechism um, that he just released. An excellent catechism. We talked about it with uh, Aaron Sang last Friday. Uh, but Your Your Excellency, before we uh, get started, I would be remiss if I didn't ask your uh, opinion on uh, what happened over the weekend with His uh, Excellency Bishop Strickland. Yes, uh, this removal of this uh, bishop, this true Catholic bishop of our day, of one, uh, it is a great injustice and uh, a sadness to the entire church, to all Catholics and priests and bishops who still uh, strive uh, to maintain the integral Catholic faith, morals, liturgy, Christian life. This will go down in history as a true black day in our current history. Well, thank you very much for their statement, Bishop Athanasius Snyder. Um, to your book, I did want to talk about this because I find your your book Credo to be a great beacon of hope and light amidst a storm. And I was actually just reading um, Cardinal Seurat's uh, commentary, uh, his opening speech on your book over in from Italy, and I was very, very encouraged to see this. Uh, so let's start here. Why did you decide to to write this new catechism? Well, it was not my initiative, uh, 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 but it was initiative of a father of family, of a large family, who asked me to publish a kind of new catechism which much clarity and doctrine and also addressing some um, current issues and, and topics of our day and of our world, and also of the some uh, errors or ambiguities which were spread in the last decades in the life of the church. A kind of actualization, uh, bringing um, in our time uh, the, um, the Catholic faith with questions and answers. Mm. Yes, I found it to be very helpful in the sense that it was uh, formatted in the question and answer format, like the old Baltimore catechisms and a lot of the older catechisms. I think it's very helpful. But uh, one thing that people immediately were, were wondering about was why do we need a catechism, a new one, if we already have the JP2 catechism? Yes, this catechism of John Paul II was published 30 years ago. First, and since then, uh, there emerged uh, new questions. Let us say the um, militancy and the global propagation and imposition of the so called gender ideology or LGBT uh, movement, which now became a political global uh, agenda. And this we have to address more deeply the errors then. Another topic, uh, the, the issue of New Age, of all these practices, of the veneration of Mother Earth, of Pachamama, which we were witnessing. These are new issues which we have to address also in the life of the church, uh, climate change, and so on. And then also uh, the topic, topic uh, which was not treated uh, in the Catechism of John Paul II, for example, the Freemasonry, and to make an exposition uh, deeper uh, from the documents of the Church or from, from their own uh, affirmations of members of the Freemasonry. This I also addressed. Uh, and then... Um, some uh, issues and topics which were left even in the catechism of John Paul II not enough clarified, let us say, the problems with the interreligious prayers with Muslims or with other 
non-Catholics, uh, which increased in the last 30 years. This um, was leading to confusion in the life of the church, and we have to address this also. And then go deeper to the roots, which are found in some ambiguous affirmations, even in in the council documents or the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And so I think we have, we must have the honesty to address this in a in a calm way, but in a clear way, mm. using the voice of the magisterium, of the continuous magisterium. I would say of all times. Amen. Amen. It was, uh, I, for one, when I was reading it, because I've uh, read through the majority of the JP2 catechism and I'm making my way through your catechism. And I have to say, um, I know you probably won't want to say this, but I'll say it on your behalf, <laughs> is that the JP2 catechism is a little wordy at times. It has a lot of words. It doesn't really format it in the most a uh, easy way to digest as a lay person, uh, whereas your catechism is much more concise, straight to the point, and just gives the answer. And so I very much enjoy reading uh, your catechism as a much more clear way of understanding uh, versus the kind of block text of the JP2 catechism. Uh, so for that reason, I think it's it's better for the lady for that reason as well as everything else you said. Right, we're going to go to a quick break. When we come back, I want to address uh, this being used as a catechetical tool for RCIA, study groups, things like that when we come back. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. Joining us right now is Bishop Athanasius Snyder. He, uh, the, he is the auxiliary bishop of Kazakhstan, but for our purposes, he is the author of Credo, a compendium of the Catholic faith, a comprehensive guide to living as a faithful Catholic in our challenging times, um, published by Sophia Institute Press. I highly recommend picking up one of these catechisms or pick up a, a bunch of them because I wanted to share with you, Your Excellency, uh, just a story that I, I shared on Friday, but I'll share it again uh, for you. The I was uh, very pleased to hear that my uh, cousins of mine who were unfortunately never baptized, it was my my mo- my father's aunt who was never baptized as a child. They had about 12 kids, and for some reason she never got baptized, but all her siblings did, and she did not baptize her daughter, and her daughter did not baptize her son. And recently they reached out to my dad and said they wanted to become Catholic. They want to get baptized. And so they were looking at a, for a good parish, and there is none nearby that could do good RCIA. So I reached out to a priest friend of mine and asked if I could do a private RCIA with them and use your catechism as the RCIA tool to go through with them um, over the course of a year. And the priest was like, oh, yeah, go ahead, 100%. And just let me know. I'll interview them afterwards to confirm they, they know the faith. And if I give them a thumbs up, then they can get baptized. Um, Your Excellency, the credo, is this what your intention is for this book? Uh, tell me about um, this, using this as a, a tool for, for educating new Catholics or study groups, things like that. Yes, this is a compendium of the faith, and um, there are several sections which are more apt for different groups of age or of knowledge. They are simpler questions. It even could be used for children, catechesis, for youth. Then there are topics and themes which are more suitable for Catholics who are already trained in faith and who would like to deepen the faith. For example, different levels of the magisterium um, and the interreligious respect and all these, or they are also for new converts, of course, there are basic questions which uh, the, the catechist can choose from the compendium. So it is um, a book which is open for different kinds of Catholics or of those people who are simply seeking the truth. Now, you mentioned uh, different levels of the magisterium, and that kind of made me think of the a point that comes up quite often. Uh, people will quote 
the JP2 catechism as if it's infallible and say, but the catechism says, and then we'll use that as an infallible document um, and try to use it to for proof texting. So where what does the different catechisms fall on in terms of its level of magisterium, how people should react to it? Because I think a lot of people think that the catechism of JP2 is infallible document and they're wondering what's up why why would we ever look at a different catechism uh, yes this is in the last time even good catholics in uh, even among priests there is a kind of ignorance about the different levels of the magisterium we witnessed a kind of de facto total infallibilization of any word but which a Pope spoke, and this is not Catholic, this is an um, exaggeration, of course. And so therefore we have to carefully explain the different levels of the magisterium. This I did purposely in my book. So, uh, the, of course, there are sections <clears throat> and affirmations in the Catechism of John Paul II, which are infallible because they were uh, proclaimed in the past as infallible. The, the councils still until Vatican II, almost all proclaimed formerly uh, infallible statements or some popes rarely. And these are also mentioned and quoted in the John Paul II Catechism. But the other affirmations which are not uh, expressively uh, indicated and marked as this is an infallible definite teaching have not per se the character of infallibility. So they are open to be in some way corrected or um, modified or really um, better explained. So this is a different level. Uh, we have to carefully distinguish this. I think it's a very good, important thing for uh, people to keep in mind that um, the JP2 Catechism is only infallible on the things that they're just quoting from things that are already declared infallible. And in that case, it's infallible just as much as I would be infallible if I read the infallible statements from previous popes than what I said was infallible, but not because I said it, but because I'm quoting an infallible statement. And that's basically what the JP2 catechism is doing. And so I think that's important for people to keep in mind whenever they look at it. Now, Your Excellency, there are many people who have some cri uh, critiques of your catechism. I saw a number of people saying that this is just uh, radical traditionalism. This is in opposition to the Pope. And this is a uh, very bad. It's heterodoxy. It's a rejection of the council. Um, Your Excellency, how would you respond to those kind of accusations against your catechism? These accusations are very general and do not carefully uh, take into account the, the, my expressions and my affirmations there. There's no, I've never stated that I reject the council. This is simply not true. I am not against the Pope, Pope Francis, but I respectfully mentioned his ambiguous teaching <clears throat> uh, twice, uh, first concerning the, his permission for um, divorced and, and re civilly remarried couples in some cases to go to Holy Communion, even if they are not able to live as brother and sister. So this is against the entire tradition of the church. This evidently undermines the indissolubility of the marriage and the holiness of the Eucharist. And I mentioned simply this. We have to be honest and state this. It's not polemics. It's simply a state stating that this is really against the entire his, uh, um, constant tradition of the church. And in this concrete act, Pope Francis was not infallible and did not claim to be infallible. Therefore, he can commit an error 
and be respectfully um, admonished. Mm. And the other case uh, where he signed the Abu Dhabi, so-called Abu Dhabi document on the um, diversity of religions, saying that this is the wise will of God. This is a direct undermining of the first commandment of God, you shall not have other gods, other religions beside me. And so you see this, it would be um, not honest if I would not mention this. And this is, on the contrary, a service for the Pope. I did a service for him. I did basically a fraternal help to him with this uh, respectful admonition and correction. And the same in some expressions of the Council, maybe one, two only. The rest um, I did not mention and I also saying oftentimes that I, that the Council, the Second Vatican Council contains beautiful teachings which we can use of course, but contains some problematic evidently problematic and ambiguous affirmations which we have to clarify and to address. And it, this I did. And in this way it was a help, a contribution, because the Church, we are not in a dictatorship where you can nothing say and blindly simply accept. No, uh, we have our reason. Chesterton <laughs> made this uh, humoristic affirmation. A Catholic man upon entering the church is asked to take off his head, but not his head, <laughs> so not his reason, to take off his head, or his covering of his head, and not his head. No? And so therefore we Catholics we can, and when there is evident, um, evident ambiguity and this connection with the constant tradition, we have to address this. And later, uh, the Magisterium will, will, without doubt, clarify this in a completely unambiguous way. This will come. Amen. Amen. And I take very great solace in the fact that this your your compendium is endorsed by at least four bishops, including Cardinal Sarah and with Dr. Scott Hahn, amongst many, many other uh, wonderful people like uh, the Scola Veritatis community of contemplative nuns, uh, very beautiful religious sisters. And I, we love to see that. So uh, we're just about out of time, Your Excellency. Before we go, I wanted to ask, um, where can people pick up the book? What do you recommend uh, people should get, uh, get a hold of it? And can you leave us with your Episcopal blessing? Yes, practically you can order a book at Sophia Press or Amazon. And concretely, I would suggest to start with the first chapters of the we are more simpler questions, the, the basic, the foundation of our faith, why we are Christians, uh, about God, about the revelation of God, about our Lord Jesus Christ and the Church. So these are the basic truths. I would start there, maybe parallelly also go to the morals, what is sin, what is virtue, to also to have some practical advices, and then also take something from the third part, what is prayer, to know what is prayer. Simply to choose in the first in the beginning, these simpler questions of every any of of each of these three parts. You know, there are three parts: what we what we believe, how we have to live, how we have to pray. And this maybe for the beginning it would be good, and then progressively read the other parts, which are also necessary to know for the entire faith. I thank your excellency. Uh, your Episcopal blessing, please. Yes. Dominus vobiscum. Ecco spiritual. Et benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris et Filii 
et Spiritus Sancti descendet super vos, et maneat semper. Amen. Amen. Thank Christi, you. This is Now and forevermore. That's going to do it. We'll be right back with more right after this.